Okay. And that was that was really good. Um, we'll do more, but um, it's like when when I look at, for example, in my sequencer, right? Like, there's definitely moments in here where I don't use everything, right? Like in this one there's kind of stuff does come in and out but there's often textures that stay the whole time or evolve right if we're thinking like what this just was like on average versus what you know um a more ostinato based approach would be it's just so different and it seems like exponentially more difficult right then to i i can do like this was easy this took me like a day right because it's there's ostinatos going on you know copy paste there's this and then you play a melody over like an f bass note like an f top f uh, pedal right and just repeat it a couple times and you have that and that's fine for background music but like when you're actually looking to do something that's really like emotive and artistic and emotional it's, it's like, amazing that you said those words because that that is the exact word it's emotive artistic and emotional are yeah. the three that i gravitate towards because there's nothing wrong and functionally and and also to a degree emotionally those other styles of music do do something but they just they don't do it with the orchestra, no. right? Like Hans Zimmer has a huge emotive range in his music, even though if you look at like musically what he's using, it's all very much like, oh, one, four, like yeah. six, you know, it's, it's very, very much five. It's very much what you expect out of a pretty diatonic harmony that like creates a cool mood, but he still gets a huge emotive range, but he does it through the general sound palette. And that's where the emotion comes from. It's the sound palette and the texture and how things are presented. And I'm just interested in learning how to do that with only the orchestra because the orchestra itself has an insane range of possibilities yeah. of presentation that creates so many nuances. Like if you listen to any of the great symphonies, that's what those that's what those dudes did you know like you can really hear the the places that they go to with the orchestra but i think you're right it's i find it just significantly more difficult because you need to have just an insane amount of tools in the toolkit to be able to really weave them together in in a way that is satisfying purely on its own orchestrational merits let alone if the music that you're actually writing and orchestrating is any good to begin with because that's <laughs> yeah. also not a given <laughs> yeah one thing i was thinking is like i wonder if part of the reason we tend to do this is because i mean at least i came up i did listen to orchestral music stuff and john williams but like in general a majority of the music i've listened to is pop rock jazz or metal right so those are generally small ensembles and they can't really afford to have instruments be dropping out all the time right if you're trying to keep a groove going and maintain interest for three minutes on one thing you're going to have the drums playing 90 percent of the time the bass playing 90 percent of the time to, you know and that's if you have four voices right four instruments your the ability to do this kind of thing is not um, as present and I wonder if we are just like our minds are not developed in the way to do this I honestly I think that is I think part of it is that when you look at the cultures that people were in where they got good at this craft it's like and not just the modern ones but like thinking well yes to a degree but thinking way back in the day like in the 1800s like this was the music yeah, this is what you listen to. Yeah. It's like the orchestra and and every ensemble was about that. Like you're talking about a, a small ensemble. It's like in a, even in a string quartet, there's a huge amount of ways that you can create variation and interesting artistic textures. But it's because it's like it's a different setting as opposed to like you're right when you're in a rock group it's it's pretty weird to just have everything drop except the drums and then it switches to a texture where the bass is playing the melody and the guitar is playing something because that just it just doesn't work as well that way and the styles of music evolve for that and we're a product of hearing that as the main musical influence where people that were raised in environments where it's like the orchestra was what you listen to or people that come from like like john williams that traditional school where uh 
where it's like even in that golden era of Hollywood, right? All those orchestrations were all based off of all the old ones. Like that, yeah. it was all still pulling from the same repertoire. So we could say that culturally it was probably similar yeah. um, because the, the new wave of rock and pop had not really taken hold of the culture in the way that it did for our generation. So I, th I do think that's part of it because I noticed the more that I listen to that type of music, the more that I feel my creativity starting to naturally tilt towards that style i think part of the reason why i have less instincts regarding that is because it's just not like the it's not the one that takes up of the pie chart that makes up yeah. my musical listening as even though it's one of the most cherished pieces of the pie chart it's just not the overwhelming majority yeah no exactly and i, I feel like i'm more able to do stuff like this when the ensemble is shrunken Right. Like when I'm writing stuff for that documentary, the, the Jefferson one I do, I feel like I'm more able when I have like a wind quintet and a string section. Like, I feel like I'm better able to harness all of that stuff. But when I'm working with a 300 track template, which is equivalent to, you know, a, if I used all the voices, I don't know, a 200 piece orchestra. Right. With yeah, I, I'm not using that most of the time, but like big man mauler over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but with with access to all of that it makes it there's too much choice kind of so what i've been doing in my template is kind of going trying to hide as many tracks as possible to lessen my my palette and work better with that but but it's it's really hard to think about it like this i i think this is definitely helpful with reductions and i do think i'm better able to think about this when I'm not in a sequencer, right? Like, I'm better able to step back and look at, like, think about the stuff I have available, and, like, I'm. it's not hit slapping you in the face, like, hey, look at all this brass section you got. Look at all these woodwinds. Use them. Look, there's not enough green on the page. You know, you gotta, you gotta put some green in there. And with, but when I'm writing, like sketching out on paper or something, um, and making notes, like maybe a two stave, uh, you know, with a little bit of harmony, just some notes like like this, you know, with flutes, with instruments, labels like this. This this to me is super useful. So I'm gonna subscribe to this channel because that's sweet. Yeah, and there's a number of channels that do this same the same uh, thing with different tracks, different cues. Like there's some, there's some Jared Goldsmith ones. There's some other Star Wars ones. See, like Harry things Potter. that I don't know how these people are getting access to these scores. Like this one I know because you can just buy the John Williams signature score from Hal Leonard, right? And same with like the head, the Harry Potter suite. And like, so a lot of the themes, I know where you get those scores cause you have access to them. But for the ones that are like, you know, 4M33 from Star Wars Episode 2, I'm like, bro, where'd you get this score, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. <clears throat> this is sweet. So, with these, like, orchestration kind of things, I'm thinking, um, I, I think this is helpful. What, what kind of stuff do you feel like would be helpful? I definitely think reviewing our own stuff would be helpful, too, because it's like, it's a practical kind of application for um, kind of getting an opinion. Yeah. <laughs> we got a, a comment. We can also pirate the score and go to jail. So that, that is, could be preferable. Is it worth it? It might be. Um, it might be to get, to get some of the revenge yeah. of the Sith cues. I yeah. might, I might <laughs> take those odds. <laughs> You're in prison. As long as you can have the score in prison that you stole to study. Yeah, can I study it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, that would be perfect. So, let's see. Would you want to listen through a couple things that each of us have done and just give each other some, some feedback? I don't know if you have anything that you'd want to... I, I, have, I have something that I've worked really hard at and I'd like to know, like what I'm missing yeah I have something I didn't work really hard at but I can share sweet
because I think this will be good. This is, and, and here's another thing. I've, I've written so much battle music over the past years that I feel like the amount of effort it takes to put that many notes and fill time and space with it and make it sound big the whole time is very different than um, having a nice emotional kind of arc that you want to fulfill, right? And they both are, are fun in a way, but I, I miss that just like uh, scoring or just writing for a flow of emotion, right? Like this, where I, I feel if I have a solo flute playing something, that's fine, right? If that's what works, that's good, right? And it doesn't need to, well, that's not <laughs> intense. That's not going to bring me energy. So it's, it's like, I remember there's a, a video interview with John Williams when he was scoring Empire Strikes Back, and he talks about how he was nervous about only getting eight minutes of music written that week because it was all the like battle music and flying in space and there's lots of notes right so obviously even for him when when you take something that is this complex and speed it up to 160 150 bpm and <laughs> have a bunch of sync points. Yeah, yeah, no, that's the other that's the other thing. So even ignoring the sync points, it's like with the action music of Star Wars, it's like incredibly complex and it's also super fast. So it's like 8 minutes is like 300 measures, bro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's definitely a difference between that. Um yeah, do you want to go first? You want me to well, how can I wonder how like I could just play it through my speakers and then the Zoom mic will pick it up. I don't actually know how to like wire the audio. Why don't you just like, send it to, to me? Zoom. Just send it to my yeah. email and I'll open it. I can do that. Sweet. Actually, something that's interesting that I've been doing is I've been doing a lot of the writing that you're talking about, the emotional arc, but I've been I've been like writing orchestral music, but in piano improv form. Oh, nice. So, and that's actually probably the best thing to share because that's the most recent stuff that has like interesting textural explorations and it really is all about just the emotional arc of whatever thing is being expressed. So I, and I have those up in draft, so I will share some of those with you. There's hella mistakes in them because they're literally improvisations. But yeah, for sure. That's that's also one of the beauties is that it's, and I like keeping them in there. Like I thought for a while, like should I go and edit these and make them like actual pieces of music? And then I thought, no, that defeats the purpose, bro. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll share this folder with you. I had actually even already be sharing with you. No, it's not. Boom. There it is. So number five and number seven are enjoyable for me. Cool. Give me one sec, let me open that. And then you can send, or I guess I can hear all your stuff through stream, so that's all good. Number five and number seven? Yep. 120 megabytes. Damn, these are some high quality files. All right, let's play number five.
nice. Is that the end? That's the halfway part. Oh, nice. Damn. How long do you think that would take to orchestrate? <laughs> Months. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like the um oh I hear it coming back. Oh wait. dude I like it that's good I think um, there's a one of the things I always appreciate about your music is that you're not afraid to use those low notes and really fill it out right like, use that left hand to go down there and <laughs> see one you know and, like fill that out I feel and there's a, a really nice like build it like ebb and flow throughout and obviously Whenever I hear your stuff, I'm always I love the uh, the the harmonic changes, especially the like bass note, like different bass note utilization and inversions and like stuff like that. So I think that's that's really good. Um, I almost heard there's a moment in there. I like the pedal around like 35 seconds. 
like that you keep for a, a little while before you start moving the bass around and then um uh i got like a miyazaki vibe in there for like 30 seconds ish it was towards <laughs> towards the beginning there was some chord you played that was like it's probably i think it was some like open voicing or something it was like i i'm not sure where it was it was somewhere around like one one minute something definitely had had a like joe hisaishi if that's how you say his name yeah i i think so i i feel like i always butcher his last name yeah. but i love his i love his music yeah so, hey. yeah <laughs> for sure nice dude so what what that i see a puccini inspiration tell me yeah about this like piece. which i don't even it's it's just a, a random improv i just sat down and played but it um it's sort of and i i might actually have it wrong here but it's from the Nessie und dorma i think is the thing which has the is the theme which i didn't actually know the theme i was kind of trying to figure it out by ear each time it came up formally in the improv yeah and kind of come up with my my own version of it but yeah so i just like stole that general melody was from him and i wish i actually knew the melody before i played this because i was literally like trying to imagine it figure it out by ear and play it in real time, which there's a lot of parts in that thing where it's like, you can hear me looking for the melody. Now. Yeah. <laughs> You're kind of watering. Cause I'm like, where is it? Like try it. Literally. I'm just trying to fuck around and find it. So if I was ever to make anything of some of these, like they probably have to be uh, like significantly edited, but some of the, the melodic phrasing and stuff like that and the harmonies and the textures end up also being really unique and things that you want to keep. Yeah, they come during improv, so it's like this little, like, filtering process of finding all right, what do we keep, what do we not, what are the things that need to be edited or s chord changes that need to be reworked. Because actually, the one that I wanted in my head was different than yeah. the one that I figure out. Because like, and that's what this exercise has really helped me with in general is like connecting my ear to the things that I'm hearing that I want to play. Yeah sometimes like not knowing what that is like sometimes i do know what it is and sometimes i'm realizing i don't actually have any idea what that sound i'm hearing is and so it's helping me identify those things so that i can have a better sense of intuition because i have so many musical ideas and so many things in my head right and it's just like getting them out yeah. and a lot of what helps that is like ear training is like just knowing what that thing is that you're hearing it's like oh yeah i know where that goes boom oh look at that there's the sound like an example would be in the part that was like you know that chord change yeah i like i heard that in my head and that was like a magical moment for me because i was like oh my gosh that's actually what it is. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I'm like, dun, dun. What's the um, chord changes there? Uh, that is an E flat Lydian scale. So it's, it's playing, you know, G, G, A, B flat, A, B, uh, G, and then it goes A, and then the, the chromatic median up to B natural in the melody, and G is the chord. Nice. And then there was the other part where there was like some super intense like and then there was like somewhere in there where I actually like found a chord and I was like, like and I, that yeah. was another part where I was like oh my god that's actually what I heard nice. so, 
It's helped me find ways in which I can hear where I want to go. And those are like wins. Now I know what that thing is. And it's also helped me find ways in which it's like, all right, I know this sound exists in my body and in my mind and in my art, but I don't actually know what it is. And it gives me things to like figure yeah. out. You know what I was just thinking about? Because the thing, the only thing with that is the with this is it's it's sometimes hard to identify like the the melody or the the primary point of interest because it's all the same, it's all in piano, right? Like, and that's I think one of the biggest purposes of orchestration is to be able to effectively create layers and effectively communicate different ideas so that the ear can identify them as separate and you know i feel like that's because the orchestra is comprised of mostly single note instruments i suppose i think that'd be true uh, unless you count every string player um but even then like in general we're looking at single single line stuff um the the that's very different than piano, even though you can theoretically say that there are these lines. Technically, it doesn't have to be heard that way, right? There's nothing necessarily, like maybe the line is like jumping octaves all over the place to random notes. Maybe that's the line, but we wouldn't know, you know, without um, uh, some way to define each line as separate and linear right so i feel like that's one of the things and another thing that separates orchestrating for orchestra from going back to like a, a band or pop or rock band the, the guitar it it's a, it's more often than not switches between just playing chords and playing lead right and playing a melody so or a counter melody but it it's usually one or the other whereas it's always both with the orchestra. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, the I love the orchestra for that reason, that it has the ability to, like you can have lines come out really clearly in the bass line, you can have lines come out all over the place, you can have really interesting textures, and depending on how you reinforce things, you can guide the ear to hear something over the others or at least good orchestrators like that's the whole point is balancing it so that the main idea you want to hear is easily identified as the main thing and it has many layers but it has a logic to them that is intuitive to the listener just by listening yeah you don't have to actually like maybe you know you you listen real closely and you're like oh did you hear that tchaikovsky reference in the timpani but yeah it's like you know, I feel like that stuff should be more like Easter eggs as opposed to you need to do that just to hear what you're supposed to be hearing. Yeah. Or, or hear what the composer wants you to hear, you know? No, for sure. Well, I like that piece. Um, I have it in my iTunes now. Taking up 120 megabytes of space. <laughs> um, so I'm going to play this one next. This is probably... I always say this after I finish something, but probably the best orchestration that I've done, I feel like, in terms of, I, I don't know what I would change about, like, I sure, I know like a few small things that I could add and stuff, but in general, this is the top of where I'm at right now in terms of ability to orchestrate um, and create a two, two minute, 40 second piece of music that has to maintain a high level of energy um, while changing and utilizing different elements so this you've heard a version of this before but it's been much added to cool that's not it all right that's just a drum part for it
That's it. Nice, dude. Lots of notes. <laughs> Too many notes, as Mozart's yeah, critics would it's, say. It's <laughs> yeah, just just stick a couple out and it'll be perfect. <laughs> Uh, I think in general, like, I, I hear that there's so many notes going on, and I also don't hear it. Yeah. It's like, it sounds like there's the melody lines come out really strong, and I hear those really clearly. And then I feel like sometimes half the orchestra is just sitting around because I can't really hear it, and I'm sure it's doing something. Maybe it's from some of the rhythmic intensity I think could, I don't think you would lose it if you had the drums instead of playing a pattern, only play like a skeleton of the pattern and let the, cause I imagine what's happening is you have your drums going like, you know, you're done, you know, stuff. And then underneath that you have lots of activity happening in the families. Like you probably have lots of like bum, 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 bum type stuff in your brass right. or like da, 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 like, you know, no, 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 like yeah. kind of stuff in the strings, whatever it is. I feel like I would want it would be a lot more life full if those instrumental ideas that we're doing ostinatos and carrying things were actually louder, and the drums yeah. were sort of just like dum, bum, yeah. bum. There's actually bum, multiple bum. versions of percussion for this song that will play in the app differently. So there's this won't play all the time. There's also like just a like normal percussion section. Oh yeah, is this is this one of the tunes that has, that yeah. has like layering? So at the very least the percussion will probably be quieter at some points. So yeah, but I, I definitely know what you're saying. It's like the there's certain points like there's so much like right here, there's so much going on. Let's turn it down a little bit. Like like Like, you can hear this stuff peeking out, you know, like the, the string runs and woodwind runs, which is, I feel like, how it should be, but... But there's definitely a lot that's covered up by even just, like, cymbal crashes and stuff. Yeah, and, that, and that's what it sort of feels like. It's like, I want to hear some of that stuff. Like, I want to hear some of that chaos and not just have it be a blur that every once in a while yeah, da, 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 and it's like yeah. oh there it is like <laughs> like it comes out like you know because that to me is what should be creating the texture yeah and it's like you want to hear that type of that type of stuff like here's a good example this is like not as um this is not as as intense as your piece but it, it i think it does fairly well what i'm thinking of mm -hmm. have you ever heard the suite from hook like Flight yeah to neverland yeah well definitely i i know what you mean what you mean john williams is probably the best at doing that right Where yeah that, and that's why that piece is a good example because like you can hear all of the stuff really clearly but all of the energy is coming from the instruments themselves creating the texture as opposed yeah. to the energy coming from percussion and then there's just sort of textural chaos yeah. in the instruments which sort of lessens their actual musical impact and just makes it so that they're just adding to the intensity which for certain moments they are like really big and that there were moments in there where that really worked where it's like yeah. actually that hearing everything like it's like an orchestra ripping itself apart yeah everyone's doing their own thing and going crazy like worked awesome but then there were parts where it got into a groove and it's like when it gets into that groove it's like i want the groove to come from the orchestra and not from the the drums if we're thinking about maximally using the orchestra yeah. right obviously drums are great and you can use them and they're awesome and they're badass like you know no one's gonna my favorite use of drums in, in film music is han zimmer's like six drummers in man of steel oh like, yeah i so i love <laughs> like a, a banging rocking drum drum groove yeah but um I think if we're focusing on getting that type of thing from orchestration, it's like that same thing. It's like, I want to hear that clearly just repeated in, you know, the trombones. You know, and it's like, and then you hear that energy and you feel that, that punch coming from the brass and you hear the notes 
and it frees up some of the sonic space and then the the percussion becomes used to accent things and occasionally for really big moments suddenly now you've got the big drums booming through the groove and then like all the other instruments go kind of chaotic like the brass does the clusters the strings are going crazy the winds are on runs and all of yeah. a sudden now you have a really big chaotic moment it's there's, like and then you can you can shift and get more colors out of it i think yeah there's for example um let me just pull something up there's one i did that i think i'll just pull that pull it up so we can like where i feel like i did that pretty effectively um, you can be the judge of that, but for example, like, um, this doesn't have a lot of percussion, right? Like, it has it in basically the way you said. Oh, that's loud. Let's see. Actually, hold on, let's go back. Yes, already, like, yes. Like, I hear all of that movement, and I hear it coming from the orchestra. Yeah. That's like a really good example, and I yeah. think that that's like, that's like exactly it. Like, where's the part that's, oh, this part. It's like, uh, oh, here. there where it's it's like a bunch of stuff interchanging you know yeah and that was a really good example of being able to hear it all in the music and i think it sounds badass and it's like and i think you could do both i think the drums are yeah. also cool but i think if if you're talking about like that same thing we were talking about earlier with it's like oh i get in a groove and that's like i sit in it and i don't know how to like get out yeah. of it like that that piece had moments where it's like this now is the perfect spot for this this textural sound, but it's like the problem is, is it's not just in that spot, it's also in the 30 seconds before it and the 30 seconds after it. Yeah. You know, and it's like, and if it was just there and there was a new musical solution um, in the beginning, it's like then you would have a lot more dynamic variety in just the sonic range of the expression of the music, which was obviously also that goes with out saying but i will say that that was also badass because the music Sweet. was sick thanks dude. yeah good, good job alex you're not Thank a you. failure of a composer in my eyes <laughs> take take that win <laughs> thanks dude um do you want to check out the other this number seven you sent well i'm that's so now that's a really interesting one that is actually like that was a piece. I use these improvs, like the function of these improvs is to help me process my emotional realities. That's what it's actually nice. for. So like it's it. like, that's how I do it. If you wanted to hear um, something that's actually orchestral in nature, I have orchestral stuff. I would just have to upload it. Sweet. Yeah, that, that'd probably be good. Just trying to figure out how large are these files i'll play one more thing for you that i think you would like um, yeah go ahead play it and while i'm uploading something this is one of the things i did for the um jefferson documentary um where did i put this so these are a little rough like i haven't gone back and really edited them to get them ready like they're good enough for soundtrack behind dialogue but um let me see this is it's it's very like tried to base it a bit off like kind of american um 
traditional kind of music. This intro I could take or leave, but I like what it goes into afterwards. Let me know when you've got that up. Dude, I like that one a lot. Thanks, man. I think you'll... Here's another short one. Commerce. This needs, like, some work still for sure. But, um... I really like writing in that kind of style. That nice. That's really nice. Yeah, you write really nice music in that way. There was just, on an orchestration thing, um, the only orchestration that I that there was one part where it's like a really big moment where it, to me it felt like the climax of the bum, 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 yeah. main melody. And there, there's like an oompa, 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 yeah. oompa kind of rhythmic figure. I felt that the oompa, oompa was really mainly coming from the piano. And it's yeah. like that you had so much orchestral strength in the melody. And it's like, I want that orchestral strength to also be in the 
orchestra. Like yeah. I wanted to hear like umpa umpa coming from yeah. the orchestra to support that just crisp, clear da 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 da. Like it was so triumphant and yeah. powerful, but it felt like the melody was like everybody got the memo, <laughs> and then like the accompaniment was still just like the piano with, of course, like the bass notes in the yeah. orchestra, and it felt like it got weirdly lopsided in yeah, that one spot. I agree. But that that's like the only place. There's another really nice spot where you had like the clarinet and trumpet playing and then they were solo and then like these lovely chords came in yeah. as a response. Like that was awesome. So like most of that was like, oh, there was a part where the piano was doing like kind of stuff yeah. and, I, and I was smiling because you're not a good enough pianist to play that yep. um, at that speed. So I know that I know that there was something that went into getting that line in there. <laughs> Some quantizing. <laughs> Yeah, I knew that there was a little bit of maybe, you know, clicking around, drawing, cutting and pasting. Um, but yeah, those that was all good. So the thing that I'm uploading still is a few minutes, but if you want to, because it's just really interesting music and it has still lots of cool textures and it's, it's shorter than the last one, it should be yeah. done by the time my orchestra thing is uploaded. The cool. number seven is pretty fucking dope in my Sweet. opinion. Here we go.
Nice, dude. That's good. Yeah, that's one of the more, um, the slightly more intense ones. So I, I feel like I heard a lot of, um, like, major with minor seconds. Like, a lot of, like, sounded like, you know, like, like, flat nine type chords. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it was, was just like this weird, it, it was like a B major chord on top of a, like, F major chord, uh, or no, it would be like a D minor 7 kind of thing, like... Yeah, like random stuff like that was sort of the general the general gist of the harmony nice what what do you feel like that so i feel like i've always had, like i really like that but what do you feel like is those kind of dissonant intervals provide in terms of emotional content right i feel like that's for example that's a place where a lot of modern like listeners to any type of music get turned off right they don't like, like to go there right yeah. what what do you feel like that functionally is right because i feel like i that's within the realm i feel like of what i find to still be um tonally or harmonically I, for lack of a better word listenable right whereas, palatable yeah exactly whereas there's some uh modern composers that like is so consistently abstract and dissonant that I don't I don't have the appreciation for the actual um, yeah and I vibe with that like I mean I don't like much of Boulez's music right. I mean I know I know he's like brilliant and I'm like you know <laughs> and I'm no one to talk because of the thing I just showed you is just basically bashing away the keyboard but then I'm also listening to that and I'm like eh I don't like it. Yeah. So it's like, so I mean, I, I get it that there's 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 an aesthetic preference that people yeah. have every you know right to, but I I also think that part of it is actually a bit of an emotional maturity thing on the part of listeners, is that those those sonorities and those sounds like what that brings up for me is it it brings up intensity and authenticity and when I think about like that. So I, I improvised that when I was basically struggling with my burnout. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and all those little parts where it's like major and like, those were all just these little fleeting moments of me, like trying to like put the smile on and it just always got overwhelmed and sucked up by this ocean yeah. of suck, which was my, which was my life experience in that, uh, in that week that I, improv that and so like those emotions are real and i think a lot of the reasons that people don't like that stuff as much is not just because of the dissonance but i think it's because it, it triggers uncomfortable emotions because it's like now here's a person who is willing to put out just how much life sucks right now yeah. and it's like and i think part of the reason that we don't like it is actually because we can empathize with it again aesthetical preferences to the side because you could just not like a certain you can just not like a sound and that's your right to not like yeah. a sound. But then there's the, I don't like this because this is a, a bummer. This is, de this is depressing or this is scary. And it's like that to me speaks to one's own inability to enjoy art that takes them to an emotional place that they're not comfortable with. And that's when people are like, I want to listen to, you know, more feel good stuff you know and, and it's yeah. actually less about the musical sounds and more about just the emotional experience that they look to get from their art which is like which everybody has their right to right you know like yeah. some people like depressing movies i like i like the negative emotions like i enjoy 
the entire feeling spectrum. I like feelings of intensity. I like feelings of sadness, you know, feelings of anger. I think that they're a valuable part of human experience. And a lot of people only like to enjoy the, the more positive ones. So we can think of like movies, you know, like some people just don't like watching tear jerkers. They don't like watching depressing movies. They don't like watching dark movies that show like the real nasty parts of what yeah. the human mind is capable of, like, you know, seven or things like that. You yeah, know, I, I know I have horror movies. couldn't get through that movie. Yeah, there's like horror movies and stuff, right? People don't like to feel that. They don't like that stress and anxiety and fear. And it's like, I kind of like giving those emotions in my body a place to have uh, a bit of a bit of fun honestly like a bit yeah. of like hey you you take the reins like this thing is gonna fucking scare me like let's like my heart's gonna be beating in this movie like let's go like i'm i'm willingly signing up for it so yeah. i think part of it is that i enjoy making art that covers the darker side of the feeling spectrum and i think a lot of why people don't like that music it's not just because of the aesthetic although it could be that but it's also just because they themselves don't like to experience the that those emotions within them in this place of art they're like i want to like feel good about myself when i'm listening to a song i want to feel upbeat and energized and it's like that's not what that one's for yeah (laughs) there's lots of music that's like that but that that's not that one no that makes sense (laughs) listen listen to the jackson five (laughs) no that makes sense and and i feel like that's i'm trying to trying to think i mean it's it's one of those things that it's it's communication right and i think although i 100 percent think you know when people say like oh i don't want to learn more because i won't be able to it'll take away my creativity right or like i'll lose that thing like obviously i think that's bs but i do think you can get so insulated within your own universe in the same way you would with something else so let's say a classical composer right all talks to all other modern classical composers to them they are so fluent in talking and expressing things through such dissonance and through such like um esoteric means that for them that it's like they're desensitized to the basics right and they need that right to get to the next level of of expression but they're on a totally different language now yeah than the it, that's exactly population. the way to say it it's a it's a different language and it's a language that not everybody speaks and it's and it's fun to speak it but i also like your point that recognize it's also it's just that it's just a language like just because you learn spanish and now you and your buddies all love speaking spanish together doesn't like mean that the other ones don't exist and right. are also just <laughs> as valid language it's like because i also love and that's why i think i've never lost the some semblance of tonality like all of my even atonal music always has to have melody now maybe the melody is like weird and mangled but like I always have to have some yeah. semblance of the familiar. Like I like my composition professor Berkeley referred to it as extended tonality. And that's really the way I think yeah. of it. Like I do have tonal centers. The piece starts in B and it ends in B. It's like I follow a weird little like twisted set of logic and scales and allow myself to put in sonorities that are not following within the tonal rubric but i like the structure of the tonal system because i think there's personally i think there's something lost when you get too esoteric and it's and that becomes too nuanced for me to understand like there's pieces of music that is like people standing up on stage and like just randomly like spouting out words and like ripping up papers and like every once in a while they all clap really loud and it's like it does create a sonic experience but I'm like not one that I can understand you know I do need notes and rhythm even though I might choose notes and rhythms that other people are like well I need harmony and and scales like i don't need that i just need noise and melody but but i understand that that large gradient yeah and and i feel like in general the music that appeals to me the most is somewhere in between that three chord radio thing and that bulez on the other side right like somewhere in there is where i feel like 
and uh, I mean most people are skewed pretty far towards the three court thing, but in general to be, to to pull people in a direction that is that's a that's one of the things I've been thinking about lately is like I don't expect myself to do it, but just in general, um, people who are kind of trying to move uh, the general population in a direction of being able to experience and understand higher higher levels of harmony right and and tonalities and certain things like some songs do push it but they do so in such a um, gentle way that i feel like people don't even recognize that there's something different about it right it just feels good and that over time will open their ears up to you know constant structured movement and you know like diminished chords and <laughs> and then you know then you might one day make your way into set theory yeah. or, <laughs> or serialism it's i think that's the way to think of it right is like a slowly evolving um a slowly evolving thing for listeners because like i also used to really not like atonal music at all and actually still most atonal music i don't like and one of my composition professors was actually he he was funny i was like i don't like most music that's written he's like well kyle most music that's written is not good yeah most music that's always written is not good like you know it's like the the problem is is that when we listen to the stuff from the romantic period we've had like 200 years to filter out the not good and we now are left with the good he's like we haven't had that with today so even a lot of modern composition stuff i'm like bleh and maybe yeah. i'm like bleh because it's a personal preference but maybe it's actually just not a particularly high level representation of you know the apex of the art form in a way that we will once again know what stood the test of time once the test of time has happened and that doesn't happen when you're in the present. It's like that stuff takes, you know, that stuff takes time. That's it's, why it's called the test of time. Yeah, it's funny. I'm imagining like um, modern, like contemporary classical music, like is like going up to some random person just s saying gibberish to them really loudly and, and really softly and being frustrated that they don't get what you're trying to emotionally give them it's like you're not speaking their language you're not you're coming off just as a weirdo to them <laughs> yeah like i remember there was a time when i first started writing that kind of music and i showed it to one of my friends and he was like oh dude like this just doesn't make me feel good like this just doesn't <laughs> sound good like i just don't like this and then over time his ears got more acclimated to not judging the sound just based on its initial harshness and hearing what's actually the complex emotional thing that is coming underneath this stuff. And then over time, he was like able to appreciate that type of music. Now, like I still really love tone of music. Like one of my favorite is actually the mix of the two. I think the greatest emotional like because to me that all that distance only covers one side of the spectrum because yeah. there's a whole other side of the spectrum that major chords and melodies cover incredibly efficiently or minor chords and melodies and it's like in passing tones and non-chord tones and to me it's all about just expanding 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 to get a greater um a greater level of com emotional complexity that you're able to experience within the art which as i've become more conscious of my own emotional reality as a human that has been important to me because i realized that it's like about many situations maybe i have an overall net feeling of positive or net feeling of negative but there is still anxiety or even when there's anxiety and depression there is still some semblance of peace and happiness it might just be out of balance and it's like to me i enjoy music that's able to or i try to create music that is able to like express that where you can you can hear the part of the soul that is smiling and you can hear the part of the soul that's crying and you can hear the part of the soul that's pissed and you can hear them in the proportions that they exist so maybe yeah. if you're mostly pissed and a little bit heartbroken you can hear that through the music and that is incredibly difficult to do and i think you can only do it when you allow yourself to use 
all the tools because yeah. that's how you get it. Like the major chord does part of that. The clusters do some of that. Rhythm does some of that. Volume does some of that. Register does some of that. And we get to the orchestration stuff. Then you have even, then you have like a really intense way to communicate it. Like I still feel like the emotional masterclass on composition is, um, is Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, because that takes you through literally everything. Mm -hmm. There are moments that are nearly, they feel a little atonal. There are moments that are just, like his, the second movement is just absolute childhood joy and bliss. It's like running through a, a field of flowers. It's like, you know, absolutely just nothing but happiness. And then there's the pit of despair. That is the fourth movement. There is the in absolute anguish there's the like triumphant excitedness and the development and the confidence and the like, like gung-ho nature of the third movement like it just he covers it all and does it brilliantly but that's that's what i think of as the most interesting music is no longer how is it crafted the craft is secondary now to what is it communicating mm -hmm. and i actually find much more value on does this thing actually communicate what it's met what the intent is and then it's like the craft becomes just a tool to help with that as opposed to something that I'm looking at. Like, look at the way that they've used this motif and look at the way that the subdominant second minor fourth is inverted with its <laughs> 12. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, that's, I, I got to listen to that. It's the sixth symphony. Yeah, Tchaikovsky's sixth symphony. It is absolutely brilliant and the best performance is on spotify and it is by the seoul seoul i think seoul south korea whatever it is uh -huh. philharmonic conducted by See if I can. Oh, there it is. It's conducted by um, Myung Woon Chung. How do you spell that? M Y U N G W H U N. Give me one sec, actually. Because that's also the bitch with classical music, because then you also need to get a good performance of it. Because yeah. some performances really bring it out properly, and others it's just great music, but some of the in some of the interpretation is a bit lost. Yeah, sweet. Well, I'll give that a listen. Yeah, Tchaikovsky's Symphony Number no. 6. And at the very end, they have another Rachmaninoff... They have a Rachmaninoff piece that's just a part of that recording. But yeah, the first four tracks in order is the first four movements. Nice. And it's, uh, it is absolutely a whirlwind. Then why don't, how about this? For, for next week, why don't I take a listen to this? And then we can do some, some discussion about this and maybe go in depth and, and do, review a couple more tracks. How's that sound? Yeah, dude, that sounds good. And also, if you wanted to take a listen to the more orchestra-related one, that oh, one yeah, can yeah. just uploading. Yeah, let's do that. And then that can be the last thing we do, and then Sweet. Get, on, get on with the day. I like this whole Twitch thing, just streaming. Pretty sweet. Are you going to send it in email? Uh, it's in the same drive folder. Oh, okay. It's the very first one called Conscience. Cool. Mix V1. Nice. Yeah, mix is a strong word. <laughs> Here we go.
Hein? That's super nice. I really like that. Especially that ending there, when it changes key at the end there. That's that's nice where you got some of the... That, that's really cool. Nice work. Thank you, my dude. Yeah, that one was a fun... Sim similar to like what I was trying to talk about earlier with Jess, although a little bit less with the dissonant vocabulary, but like trying to weave in between and out of different different sort of experiences and moods using the same general material. There's really only like two main ideas there, which one is the, the chord idea. Like that, that yeah. thing, and the other. that main little melodic fragment and then it gets turned into like all kinds of cool like little like dorian stuff and weird little you know major sort of sounding things and in the end it's actually quite quite transformed and relaxed yeah that's that's great i really like that piece i'm gonna listen to that again are you in any way able to open up that session I do not know because that was a that was a from a long time ago. That was like a digital performer session. Oh, okay. I, almost, okay. I almost actually want to like remaster it with better samples and because the the piano, harp, and synth stuff are all sound really tight and like very spatialized very well. The brass it sounds like it's in mono in the center almost, and the cello positioning is odd it's like where the violas are but like the it's it sounds like there's like no reverb on a lot of the stuff so with a, a bit of that and just some some tweaking i think that could sound like really smooth and nice like like you said if you update some of the samples and even take the strings that you have and then double them right bring those down 10 db resequence them um over top because they do have a, a, a nice vibe there. Um, and then the, the, the biggest thing that stood out to me as far as mock-up would be just the, the brass sounded very like they were in mono in the center. Um, not sure why. Could have just been a routing thing. 
Um, I think it, I, I'd have to look at the uh, at the Vienna because that's when all I had for orchestra stuff was the Vienna. Okay, that makes make. sense. I was that sounded so. like Vienna because Vienna's harp sounds great, and I was like <laughs> the uh, but the the brass they had were the worst among them. I still have Vienna in my I have Vienna woodwinds in my template. I just have them hidden because I, I actually like those. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Was that for a project? Oh no, that was just for fun. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, I enjoy just some noodling. And noodling around. Yep. Nice. Well I'm I'll probably listen to that again. So and and orchestrationally, yeah, I I, I don't have any comments. I think it, it works really nice. I really like the use of the synth too. Like that's very much how I like stuff included, like to taste, right? Just electronic. Yeah, elements. I I like I really do at some point. Like it's a bit, it's a bit advanced for me with where I'm at with musical production right now. But I really do like. I think one of my favorite examples of of electronics mixed as used as like an orchestration device is like the the dark night soundtrack yeah. is great at mixing the orchestra with the electronics and having it really just be another color and there's yeah, also yeah. stuff that you know RIP but that Johan Johansson did where yeah. he, he has RIP is the Johan Yo what is all right. He had a lot of really nice music that used really cool electronic elements, but also still really used orchestration elements. And that was like that, a good example of the whole, like, you don't need to be one or the other. Like there's actually a, a mix, right? Like there is only orchestra and there is pure orchestration through electronics, but like you can actually use electronics to be, to come from this, this uh, to be a part of the orchestra in a way, and to be a color, and to just be used in textures and in different combinations with other orchestral textures, and actually come up with like a super orchestra almost. Yeah. Because you've got this entire computer possibility, but you're not like it's not like one is just going along with the other. It's like they very much are both alive and engaged, and that is a really another really cool. If we're talking about like. You know, I, I'm more comfortable doing that with tonalities like traditional tonality and yeah. extended tonality. But the other way to do that is through just like traditional orchestration and electronics is the yeah. same sort of dichotomy. Where it's yeah, like you totally. can really mix those two styles and and come up with like a hybrid that really is very complex in terms of its ability to say specific things. Yeah, for sure. Sweet. Well we'll just hit the two hour mark so let's uh let's log off but man that was this was a lot of fun it's always good talking about music stuff so let's let's do this again next next week if you're free same time i guess yeah dude sounds like a plan to me sweet well i'll take a listen to uh tchaikovsky six and we'll, we'll talk about that and bring any any other stuff you want to like review. you could just pick um because it's obviously it's a symphony and we're not we're yeah not, yeah we're not breaking down an hour of orchestration yeah. you know but like if you if any whatever parts stand out to you go ahead and like you know mark them or something if we can find what measures they are in the score or what pages they are in a pdf or whatever i can send you the pdf of the score that i use so that we're using the same edition i'll email that to you um, also i have one for you to listen to it's yeah it's go ahead sure. and send me something um, let's see. So this is the um, the track it's playing. 
I stop it. But it's off this album. It's not the Rite of Spring. It's the first track on this by Preton, it's W WC Trace Madere, something like that. Yeah, go ahead, share that with me. And then or actually since I can see it, probably. Here I sent it. Easy enough. So I'm gonna send you a Google Drive link for the score because the score is kind of a big file because it's just a huge PDF. Sweet. Then any page. But yeah, listen to it. Just pick a section that you like, and then we'll check that out orchestration-wise. Sweet. And I'll and I'll listen to the thing that you're sending, which I imagine. So if it's by WC, there's also public domain scores for, so that'll be good. Be able oh. to actually be able to actually see it from the source. 